Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 12. And so uh, 12 through 17, we are in the middle of a series on the book of Revelation where we are walking chapter by chapter, verse by verse through this book, which is what we typically do here at Freedom is we teach through books of the Bible, which uh, the reason we do that is we believe that every uh, text comes with a context and a text without a context is a pretext. And so, therefore, we want you to understand God's Word in the context in which it was written. So, Revelation uh, 2, uh, beginning in verse 12, is, is right in the middle of these seven messages, or seven letters, to the seven churches in Asia Minor that the book of Revelation was written to. And so, today, we're going to be looking at uh, the book, uh, the letter, rather, to the church in Pergamum, but I want to remind you of the pattern that we see in each and every one of these letters. In each and every one of these messages, we have a command to write. The angel of the Lord, command, Jesus commands them to write to that specific church in a specific location. That command to write is, is followed by a characteristic of Jesus. That characteristic of Jesus is found in Revelation 1, verses 9 through 20. So if you're wondering where do these... These uh, images of Christ come from, they come directly from the book of Revelation. From Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9 through 20, you can go and you can trace back every single one of these descriptions or characteristics of Jesus back to that text where John sees Jesus in all of his glory. And so what we're seeing here is, as we read through these letters, is that Jesus is meeting his church where he is in all of his glory. And each one of these descriptions or characteristics of, of Jesus are tied directly to the struggle that that church is facing. So we have a command to write. We have a characteristic of Jesus. And then Jesus gives an assessment of the spiritual condition of that church. He says, I know. I know what you're going through. I know what you're facing. The implication is, that Jesus is right in the center of his church. The picture is back in Revelation 1 where Jesus is standing among the seven lampstands, which represent the seven churches, exactly what John said. And so he's just saying, listen, Jesus is with his church. Each one of these, the spiritual assessment, uh, majority of them consist of both a commendation of what they're getting right and a rebuke or correction of what they need to work on. Isn't that true of all of our lives? There are things that we're getting right spiritually and in our walk with Christ, and there's things we need to work on. Exact same thing Jesus is showing. And then each one of these letters is concluded with a promise of hope. A promise of future hope and victory in Christ. So with that said, let's look at Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. This is to the church in Pergamum. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But, I have a few things against you. Don't you always love it when the Lord says that to you? Hey, you doing? But, I got a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also, you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's the promise. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, 
I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So one of the first things we notice in this passage is that Jesus is well aware of the situation that this church finds itself in. The church in Pergamum found itself in a culture, in a city that was opposed to Christ. They found themselves living in a city where it was very difficult to live for Christ. Jesus says, I know. I know where you live. You live in a city where Satan's throne resides. He says, I know where you live. You live where Satan dwells. Isn't that encouraging? If you're at a church in Pergamum? Oh, great. We live in the city where Satan has his throne. We live in the city where Satan, Satan dwells. What Jesus is telling this church is that you are located in a city where Satan has a stronghold. You are located in a city that is opposed to Christ and his church. You were located in a city where persecution was rampant. Now there are a number of reasons that Jesus calls the city where the, the city of Pergamum the place where Satan dwells. But I want to focus on two primary reasons. The first is this. Pergamum was a place of idolatry and paganism. It was filled with idolatry. It was filled with paganism. In fact, Pergamum was the headquarters of four different cults. Sounds like a great place to live, doesn't it? Like, where'd the kids go? I don't know. They joined one of the cults. I have no idea. And that's what Pergamum was. They were four different cults in this city. It was filled with idols and shrines and temples. Every corner, just like here in Georgia, every corner has a Baptist church. Pergamum, every corner had a shrine. Or it had a temple. Or it had an idol. That's Pergamum. But Pergamum was also famous for the worship of Asclepius. I know you guys know who Asclepius is, right? He is the Greek god of healing and medicine. The symbol for Asclepius was this, a snake. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, who shows up to Adam and Eve? The serpent. So the serpent is also a picture of Satan. So when Jesus says, listen guys, I know where you dwell. You dwell in the city where Satan dwells. So not all, they were, Christians were reminded of this every day as they saw this symbol of a serpent all throughout their town. And people would come from all over the world. They would come to the, to the shrine of, of Asclepius to be healed and to bow down to what they called Asclepius the Savior. So the first thing, we see tons of idolatry, tons of paganism in this city. But there's a second reason that Jesus calls Pergamum the city where Satan dwells. And it is this. Pergamum was devoted to, to the imperial cult. In other words, Pergamum worshipped the state. Pergamum was the first city that started worshipping the emperor as Lord. It was the first city that began to proclaim that Caesar is Lord. Pergamum was a city that was obsessed with the state. In fact, in Pergamum, patriotism had turned to idolatry. And they began to worship the state. Pergamum, the throne in Pergamum belonged to Caesar. And Caesar and the state was the chief instrument that Satan used to persecute Christians. And folks, this is going to be a major problem as we continue to go through the book of Revelation. We're going to see over and over and over again how Satan who later on in the book of Revelation is called the dragon, and how the dragon uses the political system, which is called the beast of the sea, 
Later on as we get, and we'll, we'll unpack all this stuff later, but we're going to see over and over again how Satan uses the political system in order to persecute God's people. And that's exactly what's happening here in Pergamum. In Pergamum, Christians were persecuted and even killed for proclaiming that Christ is Lord. For refusing to worship Caesar as God, Christians were put under immense persecution. Now, what's interesting in is in the city of Pergamum, it was okay for you to worship Christ. It was just fine if you worship Jesus in private. Privatization of faith was okay in the city of Pergamum. Hey, as long as your faith is personal and doesn't enter into the public square, you're free to worship, worship Jesus all you want. But the moment your faith becomes public, the moment your faith begins to come out of the private, personal faith that you have, now Pergamum has a problem. We hear that all the time in our world, don't we? Hey, just, just keep your faith private. Keep it to yourself. Don't allow it to influence where you work, where you live, where you play. As long as your faith is private, man, we're good. And in Pergamum, that was exactly what was happening. As long as Christians held to their convictions without it getting in the way of them obeying the government, they were good. But, if, as Christians, they did not line up with the politics of the state, that meant they failed to be a good citizen. Those who didn't line up with the Roman Empire were labeled as dangerous and a threat and extremist and needed to be opposed. Sound familiar? Listen, Christians today are labeled as dangerous and extreme when we stand up for biblical values in our culture today. You're going, what now, Eric? That can't be true. Sure it is. Think about parents, Christian parents, who wanted to go to school board meetings because they wanted to know what the state was teaching their kids. What were they labeled? Extremist. Dangerous. Listen, if you do not buy in to the cultural narrative of same-sex marriage and gender identity, guess what? You're extreme. You're extreme. If you pray after a football game, you're dangerous. Listen, this stuff is happening in our world today. The same thing that Pergamum was facing, we face today. And Satan has his throne <coughs> and his dwelling place, anywhere Christ is humanized and man is deified. Let me say that again. Satan has his throne anywhere that Christ is humanized and man is deified. Think about it this way, church. We live in a world today and the, who the, and the number one savior of that world is man. It's me. We live in a world where people say, I'm my own savior. I am my own God. Now, they're not going to admit it, but they live like it. Humanism reigns everywhere, doesn't it? Think about it. Human, humanism, where man is their own God, reigns on college campuses. It reigns in businesses. In government institutions. <coughs> Excuse me. And I do have a cough drop, Nicole. <laughs> but I also have tons of allergies, so pray for me. <coughs> it rains in cities and it rains in towns. It rains anywhere we make in our culture. Man, God, and we begin to lower the standard of who Christ is. We begin to forget who Jesus is, and as a result of that, man gets lifted up and deified, and Christ becomes humanized, and as a result of that, the culture becomes increasingly hostile to biblical Christianity. Exactly what's happened in Pergamum. See, the church today is established where Satan dwells. 
We don't like to think about it that way. But we are. And may we be found faithful, just as the church in Pergamum was found faithful. Look at verse 13. <coughs> Jesus says, I know, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet, look what he says, you hold fast to my name. In other words, you continue to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. My faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So, we have in this church located in the heart of this ungodly, this wicked city, a place where they were being killed for their faith, yet Jesus says, I commend you for remaining faithful. I commend you for continuing to proclaim Christ is Lord. They refused to renounce Jesus' name. They refused to renounce that Jesus is Lord. Even in the face of death, they continued to proclaim Christ. What a great reminder, church, it is for us to remain faithful where we live, where we work, where we play. God never intended for His church to retreat from the world, but rather to be a light in the world. Jesus never called for us to say, oh man, we've got to get away from everybody. We have to avoid anybody, everybody in this pagan world that we live in. No, He has, he has told us, that, listen, you must shine your light of the gospel. Be a witness of God's grace and His kingdom and His glory to remain faithful in this world. But here's the reality. Because Satan could not destroy the church from the outside, he attacked the church from the inside, from within. Look at verse 14. It says this, But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So let's stop there. What are the teachings of Balaam? Now, many of you may be familiar with Balaam. His story is found in, num in the book of Numbers, particularly Numbers 22 through 25. But Balaam, you're probably familiar with him because of his talking donkey. That's probably why you remember Balaam. But you, what you may not know is Balaam's story. See, Balaam was a false prophet. And Balaam was hired by Balak, the king of Moab. Now, Balak, what he, would, what he did is he would hire Balaam to curse God's people. And Balaam, being a false prophet, would gladly take the money, and he would go out, and he would attempt to curse God's people. But here, here's the, this is the great part of the story. I encourage you to go read it. He would go and try to curse God's people, but God would overrule the words in his mouth, and what would come out of Balaam's mouth was blessing instead of cursing. Isn't that great? God's like, listen, you're not going to curse my people. I am king and I am ruler over all. And so over and over again, Balaam would go and try to curse God's people. God would override his word and out of his mouth would come blessing. Now, do you think Balak, the king, was happy about this? No, he was infuriated. It's like, I am paying you to go curse them and you keep blessing them. So, in order to appease Balak... Balaam comes up with a scheme. He comes up with a plan. And his plan is to destroy Israel from the inside out. So Balaam's plan was this. He told the king of Moab to send in the daughters or the women of Moab into the Israelite camp to lure them, to seduce them, into marrying them and seduce the men and lure the men into sexual sin and idolatry. And that is exactly what happened. The daughters of Moab, the women of Moab, go into the Israelite camp 
And the men of the Israelites begin to take these women as their, husbands, as, their, as their brides. And as a result, they try to live in two different worlds where they worship God on one hand and yet worship the idols that their wives brought with them into the, the, the nation of Israel. And so why is Jesus rebuking the church in Pergamum? What is the stumbling block that Jesus says of Balaam and the Nicolaitans? One word. Compromise. Jesus is rebuking this church in Pergamum for compromise. The greatest threat to the church doesn't come from the outside. The greatest threats to the church always, always, always come from within. They come from the inside. Listen, compromise has taken out more churches, more pastors, more Christian leaders than persecution ever will. The reality is, when you and I face persecution from the outside, we huddle up, we gather together, we get stronger. But once we allow compromise in, it weakens all of us. And that is why compromise has taken out more people, more Christians, than persecution ever will. David Levy put it this way, he said, Compromise has been a cancer in the church from its inception. Compromise will destroy God's people. And Jesus is telling the church in Pergamum, and He's telling you and I that there is something, something seriously wrong when Christians begin to compromise the truth in order to accommodate the culture. Jesus is telling the church in Pergamum, and He's telling you and I that there is something seriously wrong when Christians begin to compromise our convictions in order to conform to the society and the culture around us. These compromises can be theological and they can be moral. And in Pergamum, they were both. In fact, the situation was so bad that Jesus writes to the church in Pergamum and says, if you don't repent, then I am personally going to come against you. Look at verse 16. Therefore, repent. And if not, I will come to you soon and war against them. Who are them? Them is not the people of Pergamum. Them represents the people in the church in Pergamum that had compromised. He says, I will come against them with the sword of my mouth. So, obviously, Jesus takes spiritual compromise seriously, doesn't He? In church, so should we. We should take spiritual compromise as serious as Jesus did. Now, we have said from the very beginning as we've looked at each of these churches that these messages were to specific churches in Asia Minor, but they're also messages to every church in every age. And this message to the church in Pergamum, I think is especially true for the church in America today. See, here's the problem. A little compromise will soon absorb the entire church into the world, resulting in very little distinction between the church and the world. Let me say that again. A little bit of compromise will eventually absorb the church into the world where there is very little distinction between the church and the world. That's what happens with compromise. Some Christians in Pergamum said, you know what, guys? We just need to go along to get along. We, we just need to be open-minded. We just need to be progressive, tolerant. We need to do the things that the world will applaud so that we can continue to worship Jesus. The problem is they compromised in two specific areas. 
They compromise morally, according to what Jesus says. You compromise morally. Why? They began to celebrate the idols in Pergamum, in the culture, and they adopted its sexual ethic. And secondly, they began to <coughs> compromise theologically. In other words, they began to buy in to the false teaching of the Nicolaitans. So what was the church in Pergamum doing? They were attempting to serve God on one hand and to follow Jesus on one hand and yet allow the culture around them to shape their attitudes and their lifestyles. So what the church in Pergamum is doing is they're straddling the fence. They've got one foot following Jesus and they've got one foot uh, uh, following the world. They've got one foot trying to worship Jesus and they've got one foot adapting to culture. And Jesus says that is compromise and here's what the problem is. They, they had neglected Romans 12 which says do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't compromise. But what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern the will of God. How many times have you said, man, I just want, want to know what God's will is? Tells us right here. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern God's will for His good, acceptable, and perfect will. The church in Pergamum had neglected this. They were, not being, they were being conformed to the pattern of this world rather than being transformed by the renewing of their mind. But they also forgot the warning of James 4, which says, you adulterous people. That's encouraging, isn't it? James is writing to the church. And he's saying, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. So we may think, Pastor Herrick, it's just a little bit of compromise. What, is, what does God's Word say? If you want to have a little bit of compromise, you just made yourself an enemy of God. That's why Jesus says in verse 16, repent or I will come to you soon and wage war against those who have compromised. The Nicolaitans, they basically taught that because Jesus had died for our sins, we as Christians can live however we want to live. How we live and what we do doesn't really matter because Jesus has already died for our sins. So they, they kind of took this, this liberty that we have as, as Christians to the very limits. The problem with that is that is a gross misunderstanding of God's grace. God's grace doesn't give us license to sin any way we want to sin. And yet, that's what the Nicolaitan taught. But the reality is, the same thing is true in our churches today, isn't it? Many churches throughout our country are places where doctrine matters very little and behavior matters even less. Where doctrine matters very little. And behavior, how we live, matters even less. Let me, let me give you a few examples. So we're going we're gonna to have a little conversation today, if that's okay. Oftentimes in our churches, we have an obsession with novelty and entertainment. That's one of the areas I think we've compromised. And when I say church, I'm talking about big C church, not just freedom. But we've compromised with this obsession with novelty, this obsession with entertainment. We think, oh man, I just got to go to church so I can be entertained. Let me tell you, this message today is probably the least entertaining message you'll get in a long time. But the message is straight out of Scripture. But here's the reality. We want to be entertained. In fact, I was... A few weeks ago on Super Bowl Sunday, I was watching clips on social media of this church in Cincinnati. 
And every year at Super Bowl Sunday, they do a huge Super Bowl uh, themed service. Like everybody walks in, it's like a big Super Bowl party. All right? Which I'm nothing wrong with Super Bowl. I love watching the Super Bowl. Um, but, but this church, they have what they call the Super Bowl of preaching, which basically means they have two teachers. One teaches the first half, like in the Super Bowl game, they have a halftime, and then they, some, the other person preaches the second half. Here's what this church in Cincinnati did. They flipped a coin at the beginning of their service. The coin landed on heads. The first pastor called heads, so he's, he's going to get to preach. Then they take a Bible that is wrapped in like a football. You've seen those Bibles that look like a football? The cover looks like a football? Okay, well, they take one of those, set it down as a, like a football, and the other teaching pastor comes and kicks the Bible And it goes out into the stands. Out into the stands. That's what it is. It's not a congregation. It's stands. Goes out. And then, so once again, they have no no regard, complete disregard for God's word. No respect for the word of God that you would kick it in the middle of a service just to entertain people. What does that tell your congregation? Hey, it doesn't matter what you do with this word. Just set it on your nightstand and never touch it again. Because it doesn't matter. But, but it gets better. At the halftime, in the middle of the sermon, they drop this huge wrecking ball down, and the worship leader, I hate to call him a worship leader, but that's what he is, according to them, he begins to swing on this wrecking ball, singing Miley Cyrus wrecking ball. Entertainment is driving the church in America. No wonder we have Christians. That are, that are a mile wide and an inch deep. And then, the second song in their halftime was Garth Brooks' Friends in Low Places. Now, I love Garth Brooks. Have no problem with Garth Brooks. That's a great song. Because all of us have friends in low places, right? In fact, we were all at one point friends in low places. Thankfully, Christ redeemed us, and now we're friends in high places, seated at the right hand of God. But the, but the reality, I, I'm not against Miley Cyrus. I'm not against Garth Brooks. But to think that that is the gospel that we're preaching? Listen, all we're doing is preaching an empty gospel to large crowds. All we're doing is tickling ears with the, without the gospel truth. In fact, I'm just going to keep going. If that's all right. There was a well-known pastor in the Charlotte area. who I, I, I just happened to see this this past week. He was preaching a sermon and spent 10 minutes preaching on the caption. The caption. Like here, if you've got your physical Bible, there's a caption there. It says the church in Pergamum, which basically was put in there by man to explain what you're about to read. Listen, the caption is not the inspired word of God. Why on earth would you spend 10 minutes preaching and talking about a caption? Because you have no substance from God's word to preach. Why? Because we have become obsessed. Obsessed with entertainment and novelty. As opposed to becoming obsessed with King Jesus and his word. That's the first Example. The second one is this. Many churches and many Christians promote or ignore unholy lifestyles. There are churches all across our nation that are affirming gay marriage, gender identity. They're ordaining homosexuals. They have transgender pastors that avoid speaking the truth in love. And I know some of you are going, well, yeah, of course. I mean, that, we, we know those liberal churches. But here's the problem. Many of us in churches like ours ignore biblical truth. We ignore unholy lifestyles. And we have accepted the world's sexual ethic into our churches. Where we say, as long as we love each other, it's okay to sleep with one another. We've forgotten the fact that God has told us that His design for sex is within the covenant of marriage. Marriage. 
And that's why many Christians engage in premarital sex. That's why many Christians live together before marriage. Why? Because we've forsaken, we've, we've forgotten, we've ignored God's design for sex in marriage. But there's a third reason that I think we need to talk about today. And that is this. We bought into the idea of a culturally relevant Jesus. See, much of what we see portrayed as Jesus in TV and in movies is an attempt to make Jesus relevant. Let me tell you, folks, Jesus did not die on the cross because he was, wasn't relevant, or because he was relevant. Jesus was crucified because he came proclaiming the kingdom of God. Jesus was crucified because he said, you must bow down to me as Lord. Not that he was relevant. And so I'm not saying don't watch movies and shows and things like that that, that that portray Jesus. I'm not saying that, but I am saying to be very careful. When you watch shows like The Chosen, and make sure that they are portraying a biblical Jesus and not just an ecumenical culturally relevant Jesus. And I'll just give you one, one example from The Chosen, because some of you are already mad. I can tell. It's okay. Don't really care. There's one scene in The Chosen when Jesus, get, when he delivers the, the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16, his meeting with Nicodemus. Remember the scene? Anybody ever seen it? This is basically where I stopped watching The Chosen. And the reason was this. Nicodemus and by the way, before I get into it, The Chosen is, is, is not a fully accurate biblical portrayal. There's a lot of creative liberty in there, right? We know that. They use a lot. And even Dallas Jenkins, the creator, said, we use a lot of creative liberty. And I'm not saying don't watch The Chosen. That's not what I'm saying. So if you, if you leave today and say, my pastor told us not to watch The Chosen, that is not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying watch it with eyes to see and ears to hear. All right? Now, there's this scene where, where Jesus and Nicodemus meet. And Jesus begins to talk with Nicodemus and proclaim to him that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know that verse is John 3.16. And in the chosen, what happens is Nicodemus begins to bow down to Christ. And what does Jesus say? Oh, no, 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 no. You don't need to bow down to me. And he lifts Nicodemus back up. Listen, we, bear, we absolutely have to bow down to Christ because He is Lord. He is King. There's nowhere in Scripture that Jesus ever said, don't bow down to me. He told people not to go and tell who He was because He wasn't ready to reveal it, reveal it yet, but He never, not once, said, don't bow down to me because that would be saying that I am not King, I am not God, I am not Lord. Now, I understand creative liberty, and we know when you put the whole scripture together, that Nicodemus does eventually bow down to Jesus. At the end of the Gospels, Nicodemus is a follower of Christ. But to think and portray that we don't have to bow down to Christ is a dangerous picture for our world to see. Dangerous picture. But then there's also the, the he gets us commercials. Anybody seen those? Now, I have to admit, some of them were really good at the beginning. But there was one in particular they showed during the Super Bowl that I do have a problem with, and it concerns me. Jesus didn't teach hate. Jesus washed feet. Jesus didn't teach hate. Jesus washed feet. And we see these images of people washing others' feet. Washing the feet outside of an abortion clinic or a priest washing the feet of a gay man, a Christian, a supposedly Christian washing the feet of a Muslim. And without question, listen church, I, I want you to understand the ideas of love and humility and grace and loving our neighbors are fundamental to our biblical faith. Fundamental to our biblical faith. The problem is that when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, it came with a context. And that context was the washing away of their sin. The redemption that Jesus was getting ready to deliver to his disciples through the cross. 
to you and I through the cross. Now, we know from Scripture that Jesus spent a lot of time with tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. In fact, he would encourage us to do the same. To spend time with people that are far from God. But here's what you never see in Scripture. You never see Jesus washing their feet. What did Jesus tell them to do? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. He washed the disciples' feet because they were his followers. He never washed sinners' feet. And then the whole idea of hate. That idea of Jesus didn't teach hate comes with some serious cultural implications, doesn't it? Why? Because hate is code for allegiance to biblical principles. Hate in our culture is code for adhering to the biblical norm of sin and judgment and the need for repentance. People say, well, you can't preach repentance anymore. You can't preach that type of stuff anymore. Because if you do, you're going to be considered as being hateful. And the reality is that Christians are often considered as being hateful for holding biblical ideas about gender, sexuality, and sinful behavior. So the whole idea of juxtapositioning, juxtapositioning issues like abortion and homosexuality with a rejection of hate comes really close to echoing modern culture's demand that churches abandon historical biblical views. The ad seems to be implying that Jesus was cool with all kinds of sinful behavior. He wasn't, in case you were wondering. That's why he tells us to go and sin no more. He welcomes all sinners. But he doesn't leave us there. He calls us to repent and to believe in him and go and sin no more. Now, I get it. Some of you are going, man, Eric, just chill out. What is wrong with you today? Did Nicole keep you up all night snoring or something? I, no, she did not. Probably the opposite, other, other way around. Some of you go, man, just chill out. Isn't it great, Eric, that millions of people got a picture of Jesus? Isn't that a good thing? No. Not if they don't get the biblical Jesus. If we don't get a picture of the biblical Jesus, it is not a good thing. Amen. Amen. Jesus did not come to get us. He came to save us. He came to call us to die to our sin. Die to ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. That's what Jesus called us to. Now, why harp on this? It's a great question. And it's this it's because compromise is Satan's favorite and most effective weapon against the church. Compromise is Satan's favorite and most effective weapon against you and I as followers of Jesus. Because here's the problem with compromise. It's never quick, is it? Compromise, you don't just wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to compromise every one of my biblical convictions tomorrow morning. It's a slow, tedious process. Chipping away at our biblical convictions over and over and over again. It is death by a thousand cuts, spiritually speaking. And over time, we barely even notice it. But what happens is, we begin to lower our standards. We begin to lower our biblical convictions. Why? Because it's often perceived as loving. Compromise is often perceived as the most loving thing you can do. But here's the problem. If we compromise because it is, because it is loving, then all we're doing as Christ's church is loving people into hell. Amen. 
because Jesus called us to repentance. Jesus called us to surrender our very lives for the sake of the gospel. Jesus called us to lay down our lives, to surrender to Him as Lord. And compromise begins, ultimately leads us to accepting things we once rejected. That's what happens when we begin to compromise. We begin to accept things we once rejected. We begin to say, well, it's no big deal. That's the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We begin to say, well, God doesn't, He's not going to be concerned. And what happens is we begin to be destroyed from the inside out spiritually. But I don't want to leave on that note. I want to leave on the promise. Because there is a promise in this text. And it is a wonderful promise. It is a promise of a reward for those of us who repent of compromise. Those of us who remain faithful to Christ. Look at verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers. In other words, to the one who remains faithful. To the one who refuses to compromise. What does Jesus say? I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. I know you're going, okay, what on earth does that mean? Jesus says, I will give them hidden manna. What Jesus is saying, I love this church, what Jesus is saying is I'm going to give them myself. You see, manna was the way God nourished and fed the people of Israel while they were uh, following Moses in the, in the promised land, in the wilderness, going to the promised land. Well, guess what, church? You and I are in the wilderness, heading to the promised land, our promised land of eternity. And what Jesus promises us, listen, as you journey through this world, this place where Satan dwells, I'm going to give you hidden manna, which is myself, because John 6 teaches us that Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the hidden manna that you and I receive. Jesus is the one who gives himself to us and for us. So what he's saying is, listen, I am going to feed you spiritually. I am going to nourish you now and throughout all eternity. So Jesus is promising those of us who refuse to compromise, those of us who refuse to, to give in, those of us who remain faithful, Jesus says, I am going to give you myself. Then he says, I'm going to give you a white stone. What that means is Jesus is not only going to give us himself, he's also, going to nur- he's also going to receive us into himself. So he gives us himself, but he also receives us. What, what, where do I get that? See, in ancient Jewish custom, that if you were a juror and you were sitting in, a, in, a, in, a, in hearing a trial, there was a custom to express a verdict. And so these jurors would have two stones. A black stone and a white stone. And if they felt like the person was guilty, they would toss in the black stone, the dark stone. If they felt like the person was innocent, they would toss in the white stone. So what Jesus is saying, get this, when you and I refuse to compromise, when you and I remain faithful, we are innocent. In other words, we are justified before God. Our sins have been taken away because of Jesus' work on the cross. Our justification that we receive His righteousness. Not righteousness of our own, but His righteousness, according to Scripture, is imputed on us. And we are welcomed into His redeemed community, into His family. So this is picturing our acceptance and our victory in Christ as we remain faithful to Him. And then finally, He says a new name. He says, I'm going to give Him a new name. What does that mean? This new name is the name of Christ as Lord. It is given to those who receive salvation through faith. And only to those who receive salvation through faith. Revelation 14 speaks of this which we'll get to in several months probably at the rate we're going. But Revelation 14 speaks of this, that those of us who have been redeemed, those of us who are in Christ, it says this, have Christ's name 
and his father's name written on their foreheads. So that is an, a symbolic picture of those of us who are in Christ have literally the name Christ is Lord written across us. In other words, there is nothing that Satan can do to snatch us out of his hand. Even though we live in a land that is, that where Satan dwells, even though, just like Pergamon, we live where, in a place where Satan's throne resides, there is nothing that he can do to snatch us out of God's hands. Why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord is written on our foreheads. Isn't that good news? C.K. Uh, G.K. Bill put it this way. He said, therefore, this new name is a mark of genuine membership in the community of the redeemed, without which entry into the eternal city of God is impossible. What is he saying? He's saying those of us who are Christ's followers, have, we've been given Christ to nourish us, to strengthen us, to take upon ourselves his yoke. And he receives us. And he justifies us. And he gives us a new name. Because our name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. So, let me conclude with this. Jesus says Pergamum is a church where Satan dwells. So what kind of church and what kind of Christians are needed in the place where Satan dwells? What is needed is a church and Christians that refuse to compromise their convictions. What is needed is a church and Christians who refuse to conform to the society around them. What is needed is a church and Christians who refuse to give in to the cultural pressures that we face each and every day to compromise. What's needed is a church that remembers our hope is in Calvary's hill. That's where our hope comes from. It doesn't come through government, doesn't come through business, doesn't come through relationships. It comes through Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. That's where our hope comes from. But it also means that you and I need to be a church, we need to be Christians that remember an idol is often a good thing turned into a God thing. And when we turn those good things into God things, we begin to compromise. We begin to slip. And then finally, we need to remember that Christ and only Christ is the one who's given us all that we need for salvation. All that we need for redemption. All that we need for justification is found in Christ alone. He is our nourishment. He has declared us not guilty. And He's given us a new name. May we be that church. May we be those Christians. Heavenly Father, I admit this is a challenging text. It's a text that proclaims that just like the church in Pergamum, we too can face times of compromise. That we too live in a culture that is increasingly opposing Christ and His church. And Father, I pray that You would help us as Your followers to remain steadfast, to remain faithful, to refuse to give in to compromise. And for those of us who have compromised, I love the fact, Jesus, that You say, repent. In other words, I'm not done with you. Just because you've given in, just because you've compromised, doesn't mean you're done. It just means repent. It means come back. It means change your mind that results in a change of behavior. And so, Father, I pray for anyone here this morning that needs to repent of areas of compromise. It could be the smallest amount of compromise. It could be really big compromises, Lord. But I pray that today will be the day that we repent. We say, no more compromise. I'm going to hold fast to Jesus' name. Jesus is Lord. He is King, and He's King of my life.
May that be our prayer, Father. May we be faithful. May we live as a church in a city, in a state, in a nation, in a world where Satan dwells. May we refuse to compromise. May we refuse to give in to the cultural pressures around us. And may we remain faithful to the name of Jesus Christ, our King and our Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen.